started, and we're going to sing one little song in your blue book. I think it is your little blue book. You might not look good. Oh, how he loves you and me. <coughs> The streams that turn the machinery of the world take their rise in silent places. Power, the power that gives real motivation to your life, must begin in God's silence, in his eternal peace. Close your eyes, sit back, let your mind rest. We're going to, I'm going to read to you the 23rd Psalm, and if you know it, say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He liveth me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff that comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, I want you 
Would you let your hands drop by your side? Keep your eyes closed. Keep your back. Let your hands drop to your side. Let both hands now rest limply on your knees. Bring them up to your knees. Palms up. Fingers can be relaxed or curled loosely. And as you have your eyes closed, in John 14, 27 says, My peace I give unto you, let not your heart be troubled. Let's say those words together. My peace I give unto you, let not your heart be troubled. Now, while you're sitting there, think about the sounds that you are hearing. Not only are you hearing my voice, you're hearing the music outside of the church beckoning people to come in to him. We're going to let our mind relax. We're going to sit this here as I pray. Think about the Lord right now. Father, we thank you for this time of peace that we feel right now. May the next two hours we sit in reverence, honoring your word, clearing our mind of all anxieties. Let us listen with an open mind to your word today that you will reveal yourself to us and that we can be still and know that you are God. Thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to the book of Ruth. I wish I could find these books. I've worked online. It's called Try Prayer, Prayer Power by Norman Vincent Peale. And when I look through this, I have underlined and outlined so many different things here about the Lord and prayer. So when you um, go to the Lord in prayer, I'm going to ask you for this next week, try to spend 10 to 15 minutes in prayer. Stay off your phone. Don't take any phone calls. Don't take anything from anyone. Just spend 15 minutes. You say, okay, I just want to have 15 minutes. Sometime during the day, it may be five minutes in the morning, maybe five minutes at your lunch hour, maybe five minutes before you go to bed at night. But I promise you, you will not regret talking to the Lord. If you ever regret talking to the Lord, then you let me know. <laughs> you, you let me know. Excuse me, I need to borrow a Kleenex. Naomi's bereaved and blessed. Now we know the story. We're going to Ruth, right after Judges, where we had Deborah last week. Now, I finally brought my map. And when we looked at Naomi, and when we looked at Abraham, Abraham is way up here in Haran. They came all the way down. And it took them months to travel. The road was very, very difficult. Um, about 400 miles. They had to travel. But remember, they didn't have a car. They couldn't stop. And they had picnics along the way, but they had to stop and camp, cook their meals, and then, and then come. So here is from where they traveled all the way to Shechem, which is close. And this is Judah, uh, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Last Sunday, Deborah was at Bethel, and she sat under, she was a judge, we talked about her. Uh, uh, Rama and, Beth and Bethel. So she is right in here. I tried to do a little bit of a uh, diagram for you because I wanted you to visualize the traveling, how these people traveled and how they were obedient to God. Now today's story, Ruth, Ruth and her family are in Bethlehem, right here, Naomi. Now we know all about Ruth, but we're going to, what part did Naomi play as her mother-in-law? I had a good mother-in-law. Uh, she even came to church with me later on in, in, her, in her life. Um, but she was a little 
concerned about me, you know, being uh, my mother being a minister. That was a little whole lot of different. But she was very, very good to me. Very, very good to me. And very good to the children. She was a very caring mother in law. We're going to look at Naomi's and how she was so caring. Even in her grief, and you're going to look at your papers here, understanding grief. Uh, what I would like for you to do as we began, we'll go into understanding grief in just a moment, but what I would like for you to do as we read these scriptures, on page um, number 43, your resource item number two, character studies and root. As we read through this, you're gonna, we're going to look at the characters of Naomi, we're going to look at the characteristics of Ruth and the characteristics of Boaz. Go ahead and fill those in as we read those scriptures. And see, do you have these? Is that a feedback? Is that, is that feedback? Uh, a little bit. A little bit, okay. <coughs> So that when we get to that resource, you can look and see. But as we study, go ahead and, and look at understanding grief. This is a season where everybody's experienced grief in their life. And if you haven't, then I applaud you because you're, you're one of the few people that has not experienced grief. So we look at Ruth, small little book, just four chapters. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Now the judges ruled, and we we talked about this last week, sometimes everybody did it whatever they wanted to do in their own sight, in their own way. Uh, Israel, I don't know what happened to Israel, but they just could not stay stable. Have you ever known a Christian like that? They just couldn't stay stable. One, one day they were up, and the next day they were down, and one week they were up, and the next week they were down. They, there was no stability in their relationship with the Lord. And you've got to learn to be stable with the Lord. It doesn't make any difference what's coming. You know, the, you got, you got to be stable. And there was a famine in the land, and there was, there's your seeing in um, Bethlehem. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. And you can see them, they go over there to Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. So we look at here that this is one of the greatest books, the shortest, but one of the shortest books in the Bible uh, that was, has been ever, ever written. And it also tells us a lot about Naomi and how Ruth was so submissive to Naomi, her mother-in-law. In biblical days, uh, this was their custom. The uh, daughter-in-laws went to live with the mother-in-laws. And so she was sort of uh, over, over them and, and, and ruled and helped God and, and direct because the son stayed there to help with the family uh, property and everything. But here, uh, Elimelech, he's going to go to Moab because there's a famine. He did not touch Moab. There's not much distance there, but he did not touch uh, the country of, of Moab. So leading from place to place, and this has got to be hard. Uh, I've lived in one place all my life. You know, right here in Western State, and Kelly and I have lived in one house all of our time. So I can't imagine those of you who have moved, you know, different places. I think Charlene, you've been you've been to Atlanta, Georgia, and you moved back, and so she's been there. Anybody else been out of the state? You've moved out of the state? Okay, Stacy, Trey, okay. So you all have moved, and then you've come, is this home? Is, is North Carolina, I mean, is, I know this for Tracy. Stacy, is North uh, Whistler State home? No. Where? Oh, okay. So you can understand this situation of packing up and moving and going to a strange area. And Moab was a pagan area, idolatry worship. And so this is going to be contrary to what Naomi really believes in because she's a Christian. And so she's been under this, uh, this rule of being a Christianity to, to go to a pagan land. That's a little foreign to her. So as we read on, verse 2, the name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of the two sons were Malon and Shelon, Ephratites um, of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left in her two sons. Okay, here's, here's our grief, understanding our grief. Her husband has passed away, and some of you are with us, so your husband's passed away, but now what do I do? But oh, I have my two sons, so I'm good. You know, I've got my two sons, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Uh, they can help me. Then, um, 
Verse 4, now they took wives of the women of Moab. Hmm, you know, that's a different foreign country. That's a, uh, that's a little, you know, a little difference. And we find today that when children marry someone out of state, then you've got to divide your time between states, right? Uh, Keith and Shanna lived here. They met. Their fathers went to high school together. Uh, they've been friends for a long time. But anyway, they reunited at college. But now they're out of state. Now, their children are involved with people who live in different states. So we're going to have grandchildren in multiple states. That means the grandmother doesn't go, not going to be able to see all these kids all these time. So let's think this picture then. Here's Naomi in a foreign country. Oh, and her sons are marrying foreign women. Okay? Moabites. Then both Malon and Chulon also died. So the women, so the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Oh, what grief. Can you imagine the grief this woman is experiencing in her life? The, the husband, that would be enough, but now you're going to lose your two sons. Okay, and now we've got two daughter-in-laws that are of foreign nature. So what is, what is Naomi going to do? What is going to be her only hope? Let's look at understanding the grief. Let me read one more scripture. Verse 6, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Visiting his people means that Israel, she can go back to her homeland of Bethlehem, and there they have, they have bread now. The famine is over. The famine is over. Why would she not want to go back home? There's stability. There's friends, right? There's something that she's familiar with. <clears throat> Every time Keith comes back home, this is familiar territory. He feels like, even though he's been in Atlanta for multiple years, this is home to him. So Naomi, okay. I, do you not understand? Naomi says, I think I want to go home. Let's look at understanding, understanding the grief. She's, she's grieving here now. I'm going, to finish, I'm going to go ahead and read for the rest of this chapter because we don't really come until verse 18. But let's look what she proposes to her daughter. Uh, verse 7, therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Look at her prayer. This is really like a prayer she's giving to her, her two daughters-in-law. She's giving them permission to go back home to their familiar families. Perhaps they will find husbands and be there with people that they know among, among their, their people. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and they wept and they cried. And they said to her, surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, no, turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters. For it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against us and against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Orpah's going back home, and she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. She's giving her permission to go back home. It's okay for you to go back home. I love you. You love me, but it's okay. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And your people shall be my people, and your God my God. That is the old, familiar wedding song. Whither thou goest, I will go. I've sung it for many, many weddings. And it's taken from the book of Ruth. Whither thou goest, I will go. Wherever thou lodgest, I will lodge. My people shall be your people, which is a very great commitment. And this is what Ruth is telling uh, Naomi. Verse 17, where you die, I will die, and, where, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you with me. 
What a strong daughter-in-law. God's providential care. He is really looking after. Sometimes God's working over there while you're over here, and you're not even realizing God is working on your behalf. Trusting and obeying the Lord, I think, is one of the hardest things we have to do when we're facing difficulties in our life. Amen. What is God planning? He'll let us know one of, one of these days. He'll let us know. So here she's going to have a very uh, bitter lament. Verse 18, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her and said, okay, let's go. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem. They probably had to travel anywhere from six to seven to ten days to get home. Now here we find two ladies traveling alone, uh, crossing a desert, going, going back home. And the traveling, where were they going to sleep in the night? How were they going to have food? I think about all these things. How are they going to have food? Uh, where are they going to, will somebody try to, to overtake them? Uh, for Naomi to even want to suggest now that she would go by her, uh, her own self. But she may have uh, got uh, traveled with a traveling man, people that were traveling on their way back. So she could have gotten with a, a group of people and they all traveled together for her, own, for her own protection. So she says here, now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? They've been gone about 10 years. So she'd been gone, but her friends still remembered her. Charlene, did you have friends when you came back here? Central Tabernacle Church. Charlene grew up here in the church. Her mother and father probably sang in the choir. So we knew then, so even though it's been a couple of years, <laughs> we won't talk that long. It's been a couple of years since she was here. She came home. This is home. And this is what we want to do. We want to be home to people who have gone astray and come back. We want to be home. So these people recognized, her friends recognized her. But she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Oh, now we've got to go down to, woe is me. Call me Meyer, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Meyer means uh, bitter, bitterness. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has, uh, has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? Woo! Well, that's a tough thing. She's blaming God for all of her difficulties. Who else is she going to blame? Did she cause her sons and her husband to die? No. Well, what happened then? Well, I don't know. So no, Amy, so no, Amy, <coughs> no, Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite is her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of uh, barley harvest, just in time. All right, understanding grief. There's a lot of people who are grieving today. I saw an uh, obituary in the paper <coughs> of a 22-year-old this week. No cause of death was known. Uh, I think he was a, a soldier. Then you see one of 102. You see one of 95. You see one of 70-some. Some of 60. Some of 57. All ages are passing away. Understanding grief. Grief is the natural response to loss. Everyone grieves differently, but there are five main stages most people experience when they suffer a significant loss. And you go through these stages sometime or another when you are experiencing death. Denial, this isn't happening. Anger, how could this happen? Yeah, you, Naomi's angry, angry at God. She's angry at God for allowing this to happen. Bargaining, now what if? The grieving person dwells on what they could have done to prevent the loss. What should I have done? Depression. All of these stages are normal. Life will never, ever be the same. And there's some people who never, ever get over the loss of a spouse or a child. They never do. My Aunt Faye never, never got over the loss of Sammy. He was killed in Vietnam. He was 22 years old. He was out of home for a wedding uh, in March of 1969. On furlough, he left the next week. He would not allow her to go to the airport to see him off. 
He had all of his, everything in order, all his affairs in order. He said, I may not be charming. Charlie Doss was in Vietnam. Charlie came home. Sammy did not. Many came home. Many did not. They never, ever got over the loss of Sammy. When they walked up to her door, he was there. I don't know, I'm not sure he was there six weeks. It was the Sunday, it was the Monday after Mother's Day. And when the two men got out of the car and came to her door, she just passed out. She knew. That was some of my, one of the saddest funerals we've ever experienced as a family. Because he was so young. He was so young. So grief and acceptance. This is my new normal. Miss Jimmy made a comment uh, one time was talking about this and her husband's been dead quite a year. She said, well, okay, people say that, you know, time helps, you know, you get to terms with it. She said, the only thing time does is remind you they're not coming home. They're not, they're not coming home. So, <clears throat> so the grief that you, that you shared, you can, every person, you can look, look through that. So this is what Naomi, Naomi is going, going through. Chapter two. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, please let me go to the field. Now, how were they going to get food? How, were the, how was the, somebody had to go to work. Somebody had to go to work. Uh, please let me go to the field and glean uh, heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, go my daughter. And so it was, uh, and the scripture will tell us. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. He was a very a prominent man, very prominent man in, uh, in, in Bethlehem. And so he was a, a great wealth. He was also a virtuous an upstanding and a righteous man as well. But Naomi knew that this was the field that uh, Ruth needed to go and glean because uh, she could trust the kinsman. She could, tr she could trust the man. Uh, verse 5, Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, <coughs> Whose young woman is that? Who is she? I don't have not seen this face before. This is a new person. So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. This is a small little town. Okay, everybody knows everybody else's business. You know, Naomi's been gone 10 years, husband's died, two sons have died, and then she comes as a strange lady from Moab. So everybody's going to know, who is that? It's like here at the church. When somebody comes in new, what's your first question? Who is that? Who they come with? Why are they here? Who do they know? So he knew. And, he, and she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheep. So she came and, and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. They would go behind, and whatever was left over as the reapers were reaping the harvest, the grain, they could gather. It was left for, for the poor. It was left for the poor, so this is the food that they could have. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, or go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? He becomes her protector. <coughs> becomes her protector. And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drunk. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Ruth is very, very aware that foreigners were not quite the accepted in the country, like someone who lived there. You know, a little, she's a little cautious, but very respectful, very respectful. And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me. All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. Like I said, it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody else's business. And how you have your and how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and have come to people whom you did not know before. 
The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Look at this. The Lord. So we know Boaz is a Christian. The Lord. He recognizes the Lord. He's given the Lord credit. Repay your work, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your uh, maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. She's very well, she's very recognizing that she's different, but he is not treating her any different. Not treating her uh, any different at all. So we know God provides for his children. He says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. He will provide for you, but you've got to trust him. We have to trust him. And we know we can trust the Lord. We know we can trust him. I do. How many of you know you can trust the Lord to be right there and on time? May not be there when you want him, but he's always there on time to meet your need. Verse 14, Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed uh, parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and she kept some back. Why did she keep some back? She's got to take some to Naomi. She knows her mother-in-law was there, so Naomi. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an epoch of barley, about two-thirds of a bushel. That's a long day's work to get a bushel of grain, isn't it? Endure it. Then she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been set aside. So she fed Naomi. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? She was trying to keep her daughter-in-law safe. So she had told her, Blessed be the one who took notice of you. Blessed be the one. Bless the person that took notice of you. When someone is kind to you, God will bless them. When you are kind to someone else, whether anybody knows it or not, all the products and things that you brought to go to Western North Carolina, <coughs> nobody's going to know who, you're, who brought it. They don't probably have a clue. But does that mean that you're not going to get be blessed? No. Because why? God knows. Right? God's the one. And that's the most important person knows of it all, is the Lord. The Lord knows it. Verse 19, uh, verse 19, so she had told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name was with whom I worked today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be, blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, this man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Ruth the Moabite has said, he also said to me, you shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. Got to keep, keep her virtuous. Got to keep her virtuous. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. So Naomi was giving her wisdom. She was being wise. She was telling her exactly what she needed to do to keep her standard in the community. Verse 3, I mean chapter 3. So God is providing for Naomi, and, and Naomi's going to give him glory, honor and glory. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you? For it, that it may be well with you. In other words, I gotta find you a husband. I gotta find you a place to live. Hey, I'm an old lady. I'm gonna die. What am I gonna do with you? You're gonna be here, and you, you you're a foreigner. I gotta find security for you. I gotta look after you. 
Now, Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing a barley today at the threshing floor. Uh, it's to separate the chaff and the grain. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It needed to be, and we'll learn about this, a kinsman redeemer to redeem her. And in this the scripture will explain exactly what this, what this means about this. And this is the reason she's giving her these instructions to go down there to the floor with Boaz. Because he's a, rel he's a relative. She can trust the relative more than she can trust an outsider. Then it shall be, verse 4, when he lies down, that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. And she, and she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. By uncovering his feet and her lying down there, she was letting him know that she could be available for marriage. This was her way of saying, you know, uh, I, I'm through with my grief with my, over my husband, and so now I'm, I'm available for marriage. This was the customary thing that they did. A little far-fetched for us, <laughs> you know. But in, to, uh, wait, in today's culture, everybody's putting it out there on the line anyway, are they not? You know, hey, I'm available, you know, you want to be my friend, uh, am I right? All right, I mean, so they, they're they putting it out on uh, what, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Hey, you know, look at me, I'm available, and all your profile is there and everything. Just a little scary, doesn't it? And some people uh, find their, their, their spouse or their mate or a boyfriend or whatever online. O online. They, you know, they find someone, they look up online, and so she answered, I am Ruth. Your maid servant, take your maid servant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, and that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. She recognized it. Do you not know, think the town was not talking? The town was talking. What is this woman going to do? Is she going to be upright? Is she going to be righteous? Is she not, not going to be righteous? What is she going to do? Is she going to be a righteous person? What's her, what's her standards? We don't know her. She's a foreigner. She's from Moab, pagan country. What is she going to do? And he said, you are a righteous woman. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. All the people of the town know you are a virtuous woman. The morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform that duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Uh, a close relative was to buy, and he's going to tell you, he's supposed to buy all their land as well as take care of the women. That's what a close relative did. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. Then he said, Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring this shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six atops of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, These six atops of barley he gave me. For he said to me, Do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Then she said, sit, then she said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. He's going to go take care of business. A woman was not allowed in the threshing floor, so her reputation could be ruined in just one, in this one act. But God is looking after her. He's providing for her, but he's providing for Naomi, who was taking care of this daughter. In law. Chapter 4. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, and sit down here. So he came aside and he sat down. 
And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. We got twelve elders today. Now we're gonna have a we're gonna have a uh, we're gonna have a meeting. Okay? This is what he's saying. We're gonna have a meeting. And it was the town council. You know, we're all sitting here in, in, in the town. We're gonna have a meeting. And this is what he says. And they made judgments. Made judgments. Oh, they made decisions. Because they're the elders, they're the senior people there. Some of us are elders and some of us are not so elderly. But anyway, we're going to use your brain today. Uh, then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So here's Boaz. He, he's under, he's being in submission to this relative. Then Boaz says, wait a minute. On the day you buy the field from the hand of, of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabite, so she's a joint woman. Amen. The wife of the dead to perpetuate the name of the dead through the, his inheritance. Uh oh. And the close relative says, I cannot redeem it. For myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot do this. So he says, I cannot do this, so Boaz, you can do it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the confirmation in Israel. No paper trails, but only sandal trails. <laughs> you know, the paper trails that have to sign. Therefore, the clutch relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. They exchanged things. And Boaz said to the elders and all that people, you are my witnesses this day, that I have brought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilon's and Mala's from the hand of Naomi. So she was no longer responsible for this. She now has somebody to redeem it for her. Moreover, Ruth the Moabite is the widow of my one. I have acquired as my wife. I know my daddy didn't do that to me. Did your father do that to you? Sell you to someone else? <laughs> this is biblical custom. This is what they were used to. I have acquired, and some, in some countries they still do it today. I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. So everybody's a witness here to what's transpired. And the elders, we, they all agree. And all the people who were at the uh, gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord made the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. He was a kinsman redeemer. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He redeems us today. He redeems us. We are bought with a price, a bigger price than what he paid uh, for Ruth. Here we go. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Naomi's now a grandmother. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. There's nothing like a grandchild. Everybody know that? That's grandmothers. Oh, there's nothing like a grandchild. They're precious. In fact, they have a little bit more space in their heart than the children do, right? <laughs> Just a wee little bit more, you know. And I tell my grandchildren, they're all my favorites. I've got five, but they're all my favorites. And they like that. They think that's funny. They think that's funny. But here, Naomi, she feels blessed now. She feels complete. Now she has this newborn baby. God has helped her overcome her grief. And you know, there's so many times in life, there's a death and there's a birth in the same family, so it's supposed to be. You ever noticed about that? Or, or a, a baby, birth will come and then there's a death family. My mother was very, very blessed to um, see one great grandchild born. One great grandchild born. She thought there was nothing 
and, and she would have loved the other four if she had lived. Sometimes there's that, God gives us that, um, that solace in, in, a, in a, small, a small baby. So Boaz took Ruth, and, and she became his wife. Uh, okay, let me go to verse 15. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of, of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has born him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse for him. She became his nanny. Also the neighbor uh, women gave him a name saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David, the king. Now this is the gene genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. And Ram begot Abinadab. Abinadab begot Nashon. And then Sean begot Solomon, and Solomon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. There's your name. What if Naomi had decided that she was too grieved, she didn't want to have any reminders of her time in Moab? What if she had decided that she didn't want to have this daughter-in-law come home to her to help take care of her? What would she have done? she have done but God provided for her God provided for her even though she became <coughs> bitter your character studies in Ruth your characteristics what would you say what would be the most outstanding thing about Naomi <coughs> what about Ruth what about Boaz now go to God's providential oh, God, really. providential care what are major events that's happened in your child from your childhood? Major events from your childhood. Major events from you as a young adult. Major events from my adulthood. And what's happened in the last five years? Have you seen God's hand provide for you? Take a moment to feel the same and look and look at it. Both through positive and negative events. Positive and negative. How can this realization help you deal with grief, anxiety, doubt, or whatever it is you're struggling with? Several things from this study today. There's a lot, and I hope you didn't mind me reading all four chapters, but if I, if and they were short, so if I, if, if I just picked out the scriptures, there's a lot to explain in between, and they sort of explain uh, themselves in so, in, in so much. When you go to the book of Matthew, the very first chapter, that really lists the genealogy of Jesus uh, uh, and, and, the, and this Messiah. It would, uh, when, we, when we look at this, Time would reveal that Naomi's troubles were part of a much larger piece. A much larger piece. The masterpiece of God. Where are you today in your relationship with the Lord? Are you spending quality time with God? I encourage you to be still and know that I go. If you've got five minutes, sit in your car at home. Just take just two minutes, five minutes. Don't stay off your phone, stay off the TV, stay off the internet. And you say, okay, I just don't have that time. Yes, you do. If you don't have five minutes for God, do you think he's going to take five minutes of you? It's a two-way street. Naomi had time for Ruth, and Ruth also had time for Naomi in the grander scheme of things. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time together. And Father, may we realize that we need to spend more time understanding your call on our lives and understand purpose. Just to praise you. Just to thank you for getting us through another day, another night. I thank you, Lord, for your providential care this year, even in our, in our lives, here at the church. How everyone has stepped up to the plate and come forth and helped in so many capacities, Father. And I know you're going to bless them abundantly. So I thank you for time spent in prayer and studying your word this morning. And I pray now for the morning worship hour. Bless our pastor. Anoint the choir as we bring forth, as she brings forth the message of the hour. Because we're facing a week like no other week the United States is, is facing. 
Father, we need a miracle to get back to you in so many ways. In so many ways, Lord. So anoint this hour together as we worship together. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. 